So good evening everyone. Uh, today and the next few sessions we will talk about basics of brain CT scan which will be very basic presentation. We'll start at the very very beginning. Uh, to be honest these uh, slides are uh, not mine. I just found them on the net. I really don't know who made them but it, I thought they are good and informative so I, did, I decided to present them uh, for the benefit of everyone so whoever did them uh, we thank him very much uh, and I'm sorry some of the slides are not of uh, high quality some are not very obvious the images I mean but uh, anyway uh, they are good enough uh, so uh, we thank whoever uh, did them and uh, we will present them now so first of all when we are doing a brain CT scan, we uh, there are two or uh, two types of brain CT scan. Uh, we know there is the plain CT scan without contrast and brain CT scan with contrast, with IV contrast. Uh, we give the IV contrast to detect any pathology like, for example, inflammation or a tumor uh, or any area of breakage of blood-brain barrier. When there is any enhancement of the brain, any abnormal enhancement of the brain, this indicates that the blood-brain barrier has been broken for any reason. Can be inflammation, can be tumor, can be trauma, whatever. So, uh, uh, also there is another use of the contrast. Uh, we can use it intrathecally. We do a lumbar puncture and we can inject the contrast into the fecal sac and you wait a few hours for the contrast to ascend with the CSF surrounding the brain and the ventricles uh, uh, forming some sort of a cisternogram uh, the cisterns will be uh, hyper dense uh, they will be white in color the cisterns like uh, for example here and here these are different uh, the ventricles they all will be uh, hyper dense in color uh, this uh, has only limited uses we can use it mainly to uh, see the site of CSF leak in cases there are there is CSF leak and we don't know from where the CSF is leaking we can see the defect through the bone just by seeing the contrast passing through it into the adjacent structures most commonly the paranasal sinuses you can see the contrast flowing uh, with the CSF from inside the brain to the paranasal sinuses through a specific defect the CT scan of the brain we acquire it, the machine acquire the CT scan in axial plane, just like here. This is axial plane. This is how the patient is lying on the machine, and this is how uh, we uh, see the uh, images, the, the original images, the uh, unprocessed images. And if you do uh, thin cuts, slices, if you do a slice thickness, for example, two millimeter or one millimeter slice thickness, the computer can reconstruct the image, can rearrange the images into a sagittal view and a coronal view. This is sagittal plane and coronal plane. So the machine does not acquire, does not take sagittal or coronal. We, we acquire an axial images, but we make them thin slices to make sagittal and coronal. And the, the thinner the slices, the better and the more nice the reconstruction is. Okay, so first of all, let's take a look at this uh, diagram of the brain. We can see that the brain is composed of white matter and gray matter. And you can see that the gray matter uh, is undulating and it's, it, and it's on the surface of the brain while the deeper part of the brain is the white matter. Uh, we should know that the gray matter is composed mainly of neurons okay the neurons are mainly located in the gray matter and the uh, white matter is composed mainly of the axons okay the myelinated uh, nerves that are going from the uh, cortex from the gray matter we call it the cortex into the spinal cord uh, and connecting both cerebral hemispheres together uh, these are all white matter. So if you go to the CT scan and you look, uh, you can see that this is the gray matter here, this undulating uh, whitish color. 
and deep to it is the white matter which is a little bit darker in color and why is that it's mainly because the white matter as we said is composed of uh, nerves uh, the axons of the nerves and they are myelinated and myelin is composed mainly of fat so we all know that the fat is less dense than the soft tissue or the water the soft tissue and water density is almost the same the soft tissue is very slightly higher than water density but uh, let's consider it water density or soft tissue density is the same so here we will have a water or soft tissue density and we will here we will have mainly a fat density because they are myelinated nerves nerve sheath make it less dense and less dense in ct scan means darker more dense means whiter okay so this indicates that the gray matter is more dense or hyper dense or dense compared to the white matter which is less dense or hypodense okay because this is composed of fat and this is composed of uh, cells which are mainly water and all of you know that the fat floats on water the fat is over the water because it is less dense okay so let's take a magnifi mag magnified view at the midline of the brain we will take a magnified view just here at this part we will magnify it and try to see what's uh, in there if you look carefully you can see that there is these are the gray matter and underlying it is the white matter okay and you can see that there is a, a yellow line here over the gray matter okay and this yellow line is the pia matter and over the pia matter there is this network network okay of uh, i don't know just a network and this is the arachnoid matter okay and between these networks uh, network branches there is the blue signal which is the fluid or the csf so we have the pia matter the arachnoid matter here which contains the CSF and this is called the subarachnoid space here this is the subarachnoid space and then adherent to the bone to the inner table of the skull is the dura matter okay this is the dura matter so we have this underneath it is the arachnoid matter this uh, reddish line and then these networks containing the CSF which is the subarachnoid space and then the pia matter adherent to the surface of the brain keep in mind that the dura matter is a fibrous tissue it's thick uh, it helps keep the brain in its place uh, help to decrease the movement of the brain as the head moves around so uh, while the uh, arachnoid matter and the pia matter they are very very uh, fragile very uh, weak they just uh, help to cover the brain and to keep it uh, uh, flowing to, uh, floating in the csf okay so these two layers uh, are difficult to separate from each other the arachnoid and the pia matter they are difficult to separate from each other and they are called the leptomeninges together when we say leptomeninges we mean pia matter and arachnoid matter together and we, when we say the subarachnoid space, it means the space between the arachnoid and the pia matter that contains the CSF. While the dura matter is adherent to the inner table of the skull, it is fibrous, thick, hard. Okay? So, in the midline, in the midline, uh, in the midline here, the uh, dura matter will go in between the two cerebral hemispheres okay the two cerebral hemispheres and the the uh, the dura matter sorry will go in between them forming a septum that we call it the fox okay the fox cerebri this is the composed of uh, mainly of dura matter and again it is lined by arachnoid matter and uh, there is a subarachnoid space and pia matter but the main component of the fox is the dura 
dura matter okay and at the root of the fault there is this triangular uh, cavity triangular space that flows all over the midline of the skull this is called the sagittal sinus it contains venous blood that uh, is collected from the brain goes through to the uh, sagittal sinus then it will join other sinuses uh, to drain the blood from the brain okay uh, also you can see some vessels here and here most of them are in the subarachnoid space they are veins in the subarachnoid space we have mostly veins we call it bridging veins okay and before we go to the next slide you uh, slide you can see there uh, the gray matter is arranged in form of projections like here and here these projections are called gyri the single is gyrus plural are gyri okay and each gyrus has its own name and anatomical location and the groove between two gyri is called the sulcus so we have gyrus and sulcus this is another magnified view on the city on the of brain ct scan we can see here is the brain parenchyma that is composed of gray matter and white matter the whitish thing is the uh, gray matter and the dark thing is the white matter because it contains the myelinated nerve sheaths that make them less dense and adherent to the surface we cannot see them by ct scan is the uh, uh, pia matter and then you have the arachnoid matter and dura matter here lining the inner table of the skull bone and you can see there are grooves uh, there are sorry elevations and grooves and the groove is called a sulcus while the elevation or the bridge or whatever you like to call it the elevated part of the brain is called the gyrus okay and this part where it contains csf this is what we call the subarachnoid space so let's talk a little bit about cranial fossa the different fossa the different lobes of the brains and the brain stem and the midbrain bones and the medulla first of all we need to know that the brain stem is composed of three parts and these are from inferior to superior the medulla that continue as the spinal cord the pons and the midbrain okay so the brain stem is composed of midbrain pons and medulla and after the medulla there will be the spinal cord so this is a diagrammatic representation this diagrammatic representation that uh, shows uh, the different brain fossae the anterior cranial fossa the green one the uh, middle cranial fossa is the yellow one and the posterior cranial fossa the red one and in the center there is the pituitary fossa or the cella torsica so the anterior cranial fossa as you can see it is limited anteriorly by the frontal bone and uh, posteriorly it is limited by the greater wing of the sphenoid or the sphenoid ridge and the middle cranial fossa is limited anteriorly by the sphenoid ridge and posteriorly by the petrous part of the temporal bone okay and the posterior cranial fossa is limited posteriorly by the occipital bone of the cranial vault and anteriorly by the petrous part of temporal bone and by the basi occiput or the clivus so when we look at the brain CT scan you can see at the, this is the posterior fossa as we said it is limited by the uh, clivus and the petrous part of temporal bone and the occipital bone posteriorly and uh, the medulla is at the center we are going down low very low at the skull so at the center there is the medulla and if we go a little bit up higher you can see that this is the cerebellum okay here is the cerebellum and anterior to it is this uh, big bulbous rounded structure and this is the pons okay the pons of the cerebe uh, of the brain stem we said the medulla brain uh, pons and midbrain they compose the brain stem 
between the pons and the cerebellum is the fourth ventricle this space is the fourth ventricle okay and if you look posterior you can see this uh, bony projection that continues as a small uh, fibrous structure of dura uh, that separates both cerebellar hemispheres the cerebellar hemispheres it's called the fox cerebelli like the uh, the one in the uh, brain the in the cerebrum is called far cerebri this is fox cerebelli okay so regarding the posterior cranial fossa as we said in the midline uh, we have this the fox cerebelli and it separates the two hemispheres of the cerebellum and keep them in position and it's limited anteriorly by the petrous part of the temporal bone here and here and this is a very dense bone it's whitish in color and anterior to it you have uh, another fold of uh, dura that separates the cerebellum from the cerebrum separates the posterior fossa uh, from uh, the, uh, the posterior fossa from the rest of the uh, cranial cavity this is called the tentorium cerebelli and it is attached to the petrous part of the temporal bone here okay so if we look at the ct scan we can see that there are these structures the this is the left cerebellar hemispheres and the right cerebellar hemisphere okay and anteriorly is the pons okay and in between them there is this uh, f fluid containing cavity that is the fourth ventricle here is the fourth ventricle and you can see here this is the middle cranial fossa as we said it's limited uh, by the posterior by the petrous part of the temporal bone containing the temporal lobe we will talk about that in a while so here we have the tentorium cerebelli and the cerebellum posterior to it if we go a little bit up little bit superiorly uh, the pons is finished now and now we'll have this structure that is the brain stem this is the third part of the mid uh, of uh, this is the sorry the midbrain that's the third part of the brain stem so this we call it the midbrain and it is the most superior part of the brain stem okay anteriorly is the frontal lobe we'll start to see the frontal lobe okay and we uh, some here we are have the sylvian fissure and the temporal lobe here and here so we are going up now see things start to get a little bit more complicated as we go more superiorly we can see here two frontal lobes the right frontal lobe and the left frontal lobe and this will be the site of the sphenoid ridge that separates the anterior cranial fossa from the middle cranial fossa the middle cranial fossa contains the temporal lobe the right one and the left temporal lobe here at the midline we have the brain stem that's composed of medulla uh, pons and midbrain and this is uh, this is the pons of course uh, ponto uh, the upper part of the pons the lower part of the midbrain and here we have the right cerebellar hemisphere and the left cerebellar hemisphere let's see here if you look carefully you can see there is a sulcus that is more prominent than the other right mm -hmm. here called the central sulcus the right frontal yes. lobe anterior to it and the parietal lobe is posterior to it so this central sulcus separates the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe okay and posterior to the parietal lobe you have this small lobe that is the occipital lobe okay so this is the central sulcus separating the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe and we have here the right occipital lobe so how can we differentiate that this is the central sulcus and not this you go with the slice to the most superior cut the most superior cut the only sulcus that reaches the midline it continues to the midline at the most <laughs> superior cut this is the central sulcus and every 
Think uh -huh. anterior to it is the frontal lobe. Everything posterior to it is the parietal lobe. Okay, so it is the only sulcus that reaches the midbrain, the the midline. Sorry. And anterior to the central sulcus is the precentral gyrus, and posterior to it is the post central gyrus. And if you look to this image, you can see there is a big difference between the frontal lobe and the parietal mm -hmm. lobe or the occipital mm -hmm. lobe. The biggest lobe of the brain, of the human brain, is the frontal lobe, and that is why we are intelligent uh, creatures. We think and we speak and we write and we dream and we invent and we do a lot of things that the other uh, uh, animals, let's say, uh, cannot do. Why? Because we have a very big frontal lobe. This is the main personality of the human being, the frontal lobes. Okay? So... Uh, one of your colleagues asked me how can we differentiate the brain atrophy. Uh, here's the, the answer. As we grow older, just like anything in our body, the brain atrophies, the bone becomes osteopenic or osteoporotic, the muscles, muscles atrophy, the hearing is less, the vision is less, everything starts to deteriorate with advancing age. So, and also the brain becomes atrophied. It loses volume. There is diffuse brain atrophy, which is a normal aging process. It's an aging process. For example, you can compare this and this, this uh, brain of a 10-year-old child and a 90-year-old uh, adult. You can see that the salsa here are larger, more prominent, and the gyri are smaller and they are separated by big spaces that contains the CSF and you can see the ventricles are also larger compared to the younger age group because the brain has lost its volume, lost a lot of its cells, it's atrophied. So this is an aging process. There are some suggestions that suggest that, that we can uh, slow down the brain atrophy, the, uh, control the amount of brain atrophy by uh, reading, uh, learning a new language, developing a new uh, skills that requires uh, intelligence. So it's just like any muscle. The brain is like, just like a muscle. If you use it, it will become bigger. It will not atrophy. If you don't use your brain, then it will atrophy, it will become smaller. So we should keep studying and reading and learning in order to pre prevent uh, the brain atrophy or at least to decrease the severity or control the severity of the brain atrophy. Oh. This is the color diagram uh, showing the difference between the 10 and the 90 year old. You can see the size of the salsa here that are filled with CSF and they are atrophied and you can see the size of the salsa here in the child, they are small. So this is the most or the highest cut of the brain, okay? You can see this is the normal or uh, younger age group and this is the older age group. You can see the brain here is atrophied, the salsa are big and wide and they are filled with CSF and here it's very nice uh, slides to show the central sulcus. Where is the central sulcus in this image? It's the only sulcus that reaches the midline. This is the midline, this is the false, the false cerebri and this sulcus is reaching the midline, okay? It is yes. the midline. So this is the central sulcus and everything anterior to it is the frontal lobe and posterior to it is the parietal lobe. You follow it up on the uh, sequential images or slices. Again, you see here, this is the younger age group, the highest cut. And where is the central sulcus? It's the only one that reaches the midline here. And everything anterior to it is the frontal lobe. Posterior to it is the parietal lobe. And of course, this is the precentral gyrus. And this is the post-central gyrus.
okay and this in the next cut you will see this is the central sulcus also reaching the midline and you have here the precentral gyrus and the post central gyrus now let's look here if you go not superiorly not to the top just above the lateral ventricle when the ventricle is over and you'll have a whitish line here in the middle and this is the fibrous septum that we talked about and it is called the falx cerebri falx cerebri it's a very thick and strong septum that helps to keep the brain in its place and prevent excessive motion now let's go to the coronal reconstructed images these are coronal reconstructed images you can imagine things we have seen on the sagittal images in the coronal view if we go posteriorly okay you can see there is this is the right cerebral hemisphere and the left cerebral hemisphere and the cerebrum is separated from the cerebellum by the tentorium cerebelli the tentorium cerebelli is separating the cerebrum from cerebellum okay and you can see it here in the non-colored uh, image okay and at the site of attachment of the dura of the fat cerebri to the midline there is this whitish thing this is where the venous blood is drained from the brain and this is called the superior sagittal sinus at the midline at the base or the root of the falx cerebri now let's go back to the axial images if you look at the brain ct scan you will see a very big uh, sulcus or fissure at the lateral aspect of the cerebral hemisphere here okay this is color the orange one it is this is the sylvian fissure it's a big fissure that's this that separates the temporal lobe from the rest of the brain okay it's a big fissure separating the temporal lobe from the rest of the brain so everything below it is a temporal lobe and above it it's either frontal or parietal according to the uh, which part you are talking about and this the fissure that contains the fat cerebri the fissure between the brain uh, the cerebral hemispheres between the two cerebral hemispheres that contains the fat cerebri is called the interhemispheric fissure you can see both anteriorly and posteriorly with the falx cerebri in the uh, fissure okay so the the uh, sylvian fissure deep to it there is this part here this is this contains gray matter if you see it's whitish and deep to it is a white matter this part is called the insula okay this part is called the insula and on the brain specimen you cannot see the insula unless you remove the overlying uh, parts of the brain it's deep it's covered by a part of the uh, frontal lobe a part of the temporal lobe and a part of the parietal lobe these parts that covers the insula are called opericula there is the frontal opericulum and the temporal opericulum and the parietal opericulum you can see this is the frontal opericulum the temporal opericulum and the parietal opericulum we cannot see the parietal opericulum on this slide we have to go a little bit higher deep to it is the insula okay which contains gray matter and underlying white matter so another slides of the brain and you can see here this is relatively older age group patient you have some degree of brain atrophy you can see the sylvian sulcus or sylvian fissure here very prominent and deep to it is the insula at the midline between the two cerebral hemispheres we are a little bit down you can see this is the temporal lobe here you have this csf fold space between the two thalami this is called the third ventricle and here we have the occipital horn of the lateral ventricle so just a little bit of review of the densities uh, density in the ct scan means whiteness 
So hypodense means darker or more black in color. That is the CSF, for example, it's hypodense, okay? Uh, also, in cases of infarction, the infarcted area will be edematous, so it contains a fluid, which is like the CSF, so it is again hypodense. Perilesional edema, if you have a lesion like an abscess or a metastasis, it will be surrounded by edema, and edema is a fluid, so again it will be hypodense. While hyperdensity means bright, white, whiter in color, it is normally to be seen at areas of calcification or bone, like example, the skull vault, you can see it, it's hyperdense or white. In hemorrhage, you can see the center of the hemorrhage of the hematoma dense because blood when it's clotted becomes denser uh, isodense it is gray between black and white and it is when we say isodense we mean isodense to the brain or to the gray matter or to the white matter so it's the same color of the part that we are comparing with yani when we say isodense to gray matter we means the same color as the gray matter isodense to the white matter we mean the same shade of gray of the white matter and so on so in general anything that is white on ct scan is either blood or bone okay so you can see here this is magnified view you can see hypodense air here outside the patient it's air then the bone hyperdense then we get the brain that is isodense the gray matter isodense to the gray matter and the white matter isodense to the white matter and then you have this hypodense part that is the CSF or the fluid or the uh, water density so uh, these are uh, now we'll see some cross-sectional images I'm sorry the quality of the images are not very well uh, very good but we can uh, deal with that this is the most inferior part of the uh, CT scan this is what we call survey or scout this is what we call survey or scout and each line here represent one slide here so we cannot this is this slide and the second one is the second slide and third one is the third slide and so on okay and you can see at the skull base the slices are thin and at the rest of the brain the, the slices are thicker so you can even estimate the the slice thickness from the survey or scout and in, in general the vast majority of the uh, manufacturers they you uh, the this survey or scout is uh, printed on the upper left part of the film so if you want to put the film in a correct way you put this scout or survey image in the upper left corner and the rest of the film will be uh, proper okay so you have this uh, at the very low level you have this is the c1 and the dense of the c2 okay and you have here the maxillary sinuses and the post nasal space here nasopharynx and then we start going up here we will have the medulla oblongata and we have the tonsils of the cerebellum and this is the foramen magnum Again, we are going up. This is the medulla, and these are the cerebellar hemispheres bilaterally. And then we'll start to see this part that is the middle cranial fossa containing the temporal lobe. Again, middle cranial fossa containing the temporal lobe. Then we'll start going a little bit higher. We can see this will be the petrous part of the temporal bone and the uh, middle cranial fossa containing the temporal lobe again here and here and you can see this rounded structure here that is the pons here and here it's the pons and when you go more superiorly this rounded structure will change into this weird appearing thing this is the midbrain uh, so the medulla the pons and the midbrain are all the parts of the brain stem okay will start here having the midbrain and as we go up the midbrain will join the uh, cerebrum by the mid, uh, by the cerebellar peduncles and then you'll start seeing the false cerebri here 
and you'll have the sylvian fissure here and here okay and the insula as we said previously and so on as we go higher we will have the dura the fat cerebri okay and you start looking for the only fissure that reaches the midline this one here okay and you start following it up like here and here and anything anterior to it is the frontal lobe and everything posterior to it is the parietal lobe oh. so, as we said this is the first slide and we call it the scout or the scanogram or the survey but all of them are the same thing scout survey scanogram whatever you like you can use uh, the the lines here are uh, shows uh, showing where the this the slices are taken and the distance between each line is the slice thickness so superiorly the th slices are thicker and inferiorly the slices are thinner so and you put the foam with this image or this image at the upper left part of the foam and this is the correct way to cause uh, to hold the foam sorry now let's go to the most inferior level just at the level of the foramen magnum here this is the foramen magnum we have this white this is a ct scan with or without contrast what do you think with contrast or without contrast contrast did we use contrast here yes exactly this is with contrast with iv contrast and how we know this is an iv contrast you can see this is these are blood vessels normally they should be isodense to the surrounding uh, soft tissue surrounding muscles these are muscles and normally they should be isodense while you can see them here hyperdense they are white why they are white because they contain iv contrast and at this uh, foramen magnum you can see these two white dots and uh, do you know what are these two white dots vertebral artery good 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 excellent so these are the vertebral arteries the right vertebral artery and the left vertebral artery surrounding the uh, spinal cord and the lower part of the po uh, and the po uh, sorry the medulla oblongata and they unite with each other at the level of the uh, pontomedullary medullary junction to make the basilar artery this is the common uh, the internal carotid artery and this is the internal jugular vein okay this is the cervical medullary junction this is the junction between the medulla and the cervical spinal cord the changing of the medulla into the spinal cord so we are going up a little bit up you can see here is the medulla medulla oblongata okay the spinal cord is finished now and you can see these two dots are becoming close to each other and here the higher cut they are even closer to each other because they are uniting the vertebral arteries the right and left they are uniting with each other to form the basilar artery and you start here to see the cerebellum the right and left cerebellar hemispheres so here the two white dots disappeared and there is one white dot this is the basilar artery basilar artery is anterior to the pons this is the pons on the ventral aspect or anterior aspect of the pons you see this white dot if you have a contrast ct scan okay you see the white dot that is the basilar artery posterior to it is the pons and between uh, and this is the cerebellum and between the cerebellum and the pons you have the fourth ventricle okay and then the petrous part of the temporal lobe will separate the posterior cranial fossa from the middle cranial fossa which contains the temporal lobe okay now let's go a little bit up and now we'll start to see the cerebellum again and the fourth ventricle separating it from the pons and anterior to the pons is this white dot which is 
What is this white dot? Vein of gall. Basal artery. Basilar. Yeah, print fast. Basilar artery. Basilar Good. artery. The basilar artery. This is the basilar artery that gives perforators, small branches to the brain stem to, uh, to give blood supply. And then you have the petrous part of temporal bone separating the posterior cranial fossa from the middle cranial fossa. This is the cerebellum and this is here the temporal lobe will start to appear and at this part the pointy part of the petrous temporal bone the tentorium cerebelli is attached and between the two middle cranial fossae you have the pituitary fossa or what we call it cella torsica this is the cella torsica and here uh, rests the pituitary gland okay okay and then you see these are the two eye globes, okay? And this is the left orbit and this is the right orbit. And in between them, you have the ethmoid air cells. Now, let's go a little bit up. The petrous part of temporal bone is not seen, okay? So as long as we don't see the petrous part of temporal bone, it means the tentorium cerebelli is over. And when we don't have tentorium cerebelli, means there is no cerebellum so here we should not see any cerebellum okay you should you should see the most superior part of the brain stem which is this thing here which is the midbrain okay and at the posterior part of the midbrain you have this tiny dot black dot which is the cerebellar cerebral aqueduct of sylvius okay cerebral aqueduct of Sylvi sylvius and between the this is a temporal lobe and temporal lobe on the right side and in between the two you see this part of CSF collection which is the uh, which is located above the cella torsica so we call it the supracellar cistern okay supracellar cistern and within the supracellar cistern you see the root or the origin of the pituitary gland which is called the infundibulum okay so the pituitary gland is connected to the rest of, of the brain via the infantibulum now again you can see here this is the midbrain the most superior part of the brain stem okay posterior to it is a small amount of csf filled space this is called the quadrigeminal quadrigeminal cistern here this is the black thing and anterior to it is the inter, uh, inter the, the one between the, these two pedicles. This is the right and left cerebral pedicles. Between them is the interpedicular cistern. And anterior to it is the supracellar cistern. And you have here a very thin white line that is the infantibulum that connects the pituitary gland to the rest of the brain. So you have quadrigeminal cistern, interpedicular cistern, and supracellar cistern. Again here, you can see the midbrain, the supracellar cistern, and the infantibulum. And again, here you can see the same thing, the midbrain and the interpedicular cistern and the supracellar cistern and you have here the quadrigeminal cistern let's go a little bit up and here we'll start to see well <coughs> someone is asking whether we must see the trigeminal nerve this depends on the amount of the uh, brain atrophy that the patient has if the patient has a significant amount of brain atrophy, you might see the trigeminal nerve. Uh, but uh, in a normal adult, it is difficult to see the trigeminal nerve on a CT scan. It's much easier to see the trigeminal nerve on an MRI. Okay, so I think we were here. Uh, here we have the temporal lobe of course, and just as superior to it is the uh, parietal lobe. Anterior to the parietal lobe is the frontal lobe. So this is the frontal lobe here, okay? 
and then here the site of the uh, sphenoid ridge that separates the frontal from the parietal and temporal what separates the temporal from the parietal lobes which structure separates the temporal from parietal lobe the sylvian fissure exactly excellent and then you will have here the midbrain which is the most superior part of the brain stem and posterior to it you see this tiny black dot which is the cerebral aqueduct and then you see parts of the occipital lobe of the brain if you are above the level of the cerebellum again you can see here the third ventricle we are going a little bit more superiorly the third ventricle and here is the midbrain on on each side of the third ventricle is the thalamus and posterior to the midbrain is the quadrigeminal system now let's look again this is the frontal lobe and here is the sylvian fissure and here we'll have a parietal lobe okay and at the midline you'll have the midbrain and this tiny black dot which is the sylvian aqueduct uh, or the aqueduct of sylvius and posterior to it you will have the quadrigeminal system and the occipital lobe more the most posterior now let's talk a little bit about what we call mm -hmm. the basal, basal ganglia. ganglia basal ganglia are gray matter they are gray matter they contain neurons and they are isodense to the gray matter they show the same density of the gray matter of the cortex and they con they are composed of this one here and here at the floor or the lateral walls of the uh, lateral ventricle which are called the caudate nucleus the caudate nucleus contains head body and tail okay this is the head of the caudate nucleus and then you have this part that is lens shaped and it's called the lentiform because it is lens shape lentiform nucleus and posterior to them is the thalamus this rounded thing is the thalamus okay now this uh, dark thing in between the lens and the caudate nucleus anteriorly and the thalamus posteriorly is what is the internal, internal capsule. capsule this is the internal capsule the internal capsule contains the anterior limb and genu and posterior limb it's composed of anterior limb genu and posterior limb let's see it here on the non-colored coded images this is the head of the caudate nucleus this is the lentiform nucleus and this is the thalamus the right one and the left thalamus and in between them this uh, two limbs the anterior and posterior limb of the internal capsule joined by the genu of the internal capsule okay the lentiform nucleus is composed of two parts the medial part the smaller one is called the globus pallidus and the outer part is called what putam what is the name of this the outer part putam. The putamen. so we have the putamen and the globus pallidus together they form the lentiform nucleus lentiform nucleus is joined to the head of the uh, caudate nucleus by these very thin lines you can see there is well, there are lines here that joins the head of the nucleus or connects the head of the nucleus uh, the caudate nucleus with the lentiform nucleus and together the head of the caudate nucleus and the lentiform nucleus is called together the whole thing is we call it what we are waiting for answers huh. okay the caudate nucleus and the lentiform nucleus because they are joined or connected together by these citriations, they citriatum. are citriations, connecting them through the anterior citriatum. of the internal capsule, it's called, they, they will form what's called corpus 
striatum corpus striatum because there are these striations connecting them excellent very good answers nice let's talk a little bit about the uh, lateral ventricle you can see here this is the frontal horn of the lateral ventricle and you can see here is the caudating nucleus okay and here will be the occipital horn of the uh, lateral ventricle and here it's white not black why it is white why do you think the occipital horn is white is this not hypodense because it, it contains what? Cord. Cord Plexus. It has calcifications in the choroid plexus. These are calcifications of the choroid plexus that makes it dense, not uh, dark. And you can see this is the thalamus, and this is a, uh, the other thalamus, and the internal capsule here separating the head of caudate nucleus from the lentiform nucleus, and they are they are, together they form the corpus striatum and the posterior uh, limb here and uh, the genu of the internal capsule here. Good. Again, this is a colored uh, diagram of what we talked about before. This is the corpus, the head of the uh, caudate nucleus, the internal capsule composed of globus pallidus medially and putamen uh, laterally, and the thalamus posteriorly, and the anterior limb, posterior limb, and genu of the internal capsule. And between the two thalama, you have the third ventricle here. And you see uh, the part that you see posterior to the thalamus is the hippocampus, the posterior part of the hippocampus. Okay. And this is the uh, posterior horn or occipital horn of the lateral ventricle here and here. And in the midline, you see what's called the pineal gland, which uh, most of the times appears as a calcified gland. Okay. Again, the lateral ventricle here, the caudate nucleus, the uh, lentiform nucleus, which is the uh, globus pallidus and the putamen, and the internal capsule, internal capsule, anterior genu, posterior limbs, and the thalama here between them, the lateral ventricle, and you can see this dot here. This is the pineal gland, okay? The pineal calcified pineal gland, and you can see here and here the calcified choroid plexus. If we go a little bit up, you can see here the sylvian fissure or sylvian sulcus. Deep to it is the insula, and you have the frontal operculum and parietal operculum here. And you can see the calcification of the choroid plexus of the occipital horn of the lateral ventricle. And in between the two thalami is the third ventricle. At the midline, joining the two cerebral hemispheres, we know there is this, that's called the corpus callosum. And corpus callosum is composed of a rostrum, genu, body, and splenium. Fourth part, the, from anterior to posterior, is the rostrum, genu, body, and splenium of the corpus callosum. Okay? So, you can see here, this is the genu of the corpus callosum, and this is the splenium of the corpus callosum. Quick revision, the frontal lobe, the caudate nucleus, the lentiform nucleus, the internal capsule with anterior and posterior limbs and the genu between them. There is the third ventricle here, thalamus on the right and on the left of the third ventricle. And this is the pineal gland. Here it is not calcified. It might be normally calcified. And here you have the occipital lobe of the cerebrum. On another level, also the frontal horn of the lateral ventricle, the caudate nucleus, basal ganglia, the internal capsule, and you have <coughs> the third ventricle, the thalamus, and the occipital horn of the lateral ventricle contains this calcification, which is the choroid plexus. Another cut showing the same thing almost, the frontal lobe and the lateral ventricle, the caudate nucleus, and here you can see the thalamus and in between the third, vent, uh, the third ventricle and the choroid plexus in the occipital horn of the lat lateral ventricle. Uh, I think uh, this is a revision of the 
uh, insula and their comp and its composition and i think we can stop here now and we'll continue uh, later with our presentation hope you got benefit from it and uh, thank you for listening <laughs>